Hello, government students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have some additional notes for chapter two. And we're talking a little bit about some of the causes and effects leading to the first battle of the Revolutionary War. And what we have in front of you is kind of like a timeline without all the cumbersome years that you need to put in here. But we're going to talk about some of the events that kind of led to uh, this whole Revolutionary War taking place. So if you start up at the top on the left-hand side, uh, there's a little information about the fact that Great Britain had incurred a huge debt from fighting the French and Indian War, which sometimes is known as the Seven Years' War. It was kind of a world war before there were world wars. And uh, as a way to kind of help, you know, get the colonists more involved, uh, the British Parliament decided that the colonists that were British living here in North America needed to help pay for their protection. And thus, you know, charging us more in taxes was kind of the way that we were going to pay for our protection of the British Army. Uh, as it goes, King George III, who was our monarch at this period of time, imposed some new tax laws and put some other kind of controls on trade. And to explain what that would be, that was kind of this kind this concept called British mercantilism, which basically meant this, that if you are living in a British colony, that you would buy only British made goods. In other words, goods made either from Great Britain or made within the British colonies. And any other goods would be contraband. So you can buy French made goods or Dutch goods or whatnot. Uh, this was one way that, you know, George could ensure that people would buy British goods and thus he could tax them. Okay. Well, as a result of this, colonists didn't like it. They resented it. They refused to buy British made goods and kind of had their own little boycotts. And every so often, some of these policies that parliament had kind of come down with um, are going to be faced with, you know, some kind of opposition from those people back here in the colonies uh, to the point that, you know, every so often the British will rescind the policy and then put in a new policy and, and kind of going back and forth. Uh, eventually, we're going to have a situation in 1773 where Massachusetts colonists who were getting fed up about a tax that was being placed on their tea uh, decided that they had had enough and they were going to take care of matters. And they dumped uh, the cargo of a ship that was from the British East India Company that was carrying a bunch of boxes of tea and they dumped it into the harbor. And the story goes is that these colonists that were probably members of the Sons of Liberty dressed up as Indians and, and dump the tea. Uh, hence, dumping the tea since 1773 is kind of the, the little slogan that goes with that. As a result, George III imposes what is sometimes known as the Intolerable Acts or the Coercive Acts, uh, which for the most part was a series of different policies that were all aimed at limiting the, the rights of the colonists. And probably the one area that got punished probably more severely than anywhere else was the Massachusetts colony, because that's where all these uh, rebel rousers were kind of doing their, their uh, nonsense, I guess. So first Continental Congress is going to meet in 1774, and it's going to be held in, in Philadelphia. And as a result, George III cracks down on the colonists and he sends more troops to the Massachusetts colony. And as we're going into spring of 1775, this is going to lead into what we call the, the shot heard around the world. Uh, one of the first battles of the Revolutionary War where uh, the British redcoats uh, come on the land and you might hear about, you know, if one, if one, okay, one if by land, two if by sea, or the British are coming, uh, those kind of sayings, uh, basically talking about the battles that took place near Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts, which today would be kind of like suburbs of the city of Boston. So that's our timeline here. 
okay, the order of events. Let's talk about the work of the Second Continental Congress. Uh, this is going to meet shortly thereafter, and there are going to be a few things that are going to take place. First, uh, Congress assumes the powers of the central government, and they do this by voting to organize an army and a navy. Granted, uh, a lot of the people who are in our army, if they were old enough, they might have served in the French and Indian War, but probably more often was the case a lot of them hadn't had any prior military experience whatsoever. Our Navy was even a little bit more scruffy uh, because we didn't have a lot of ships, and so we were kind of re relying on privateers, people who owned ships that we could borrow and use as part of our U.S. Navy. Along with that, we had to vote to issue money to pay for the war. Uh, unfortunately, this money that we were issuing uh, was probably worthless because there wasn't really anything to back it up. And what you're going to see eventually is some inflation that's going to take place uh, as a result of that. So ugh, not, not necessarily the best thing to have happen. And then finally, you have members of this Continental Congress voting to make George Washington, the commander of the Continental Army. And if you know anything about Washington, he did serve under the British Army during the French and Indian War. Matter of fact, uh, the story goes that he almost got his men massacred uh, in one of the battles that was kind of closer to like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and when the debate was going on about, you know, picking someone to lead up the Continental Army, uh, Washington made sure that he would be the guy that they would pick because he came in his old uh, French and Indian British uniform and kind of was like trying to draw attention to himself. So that that's the story of that. Second Continental Congress also served as the acting government during the revolution. It had to purchase supplies. And in some cases we couldn't buy from the British. So we had to figure out if we could buy from the Dutch, buy from the French. Um, we needed to negotiate treaties with other countries, and part of that was so that we could uh, have somebody to sell our goods to, but also we needed some help militarily, and so we needed to have the help of others. And then finally, to rally support for the colonist cause. That was probably the hardest, because there were a lot of people here in the colonies that I would probably probably call loyalist uh, because they saw themselves as British. They didn't really want to separate from that. And thus it makes it a little bit harder uh, to kind of pick a side. So in Roman numeral three here, R.H. Lee, who would be uh, Richard Henry Lee, who is the father of Robert E. Lee, he introduces a resolution in the spring of 1776 to declare the colonies independent of Great Britain. And Thomas Jefferson, he's going to write a draft of the Declaration of Independence. That's been abbreviated for you. Uh, Jefferson was kind of singled out because during the debates, during the Second Continental Congress, he hadn't said much. And there were some people that were like, gosh, he's a very intelligent man, but he doesn't say anything. And uh, so John Adams kind of, you know, handed over the reins for Jefferson to compose this. Uh, as a result, he writes up a, a draft of it, and on July the 2nd, 1776, Congress votes to declare the colonies independent. As a matter of fact, John Adams thought that July 2nd would be the date that we would all remember in U.S. history as our date of independence, but that doesn't happen. Uh, what happens instead is that on July the 4th, 1776, Congress approves the final draft of the Declaration of Independence, and thus it is ratified. And that is the date that we remember in U.S. history is the date of our independence. So thank you very much. Hopefully you got everything written down that you needed.